How you doing? My name is Greg Robin. I have a uh, small equity research business down here called Random Walk Financial. And we focus on using big data to try to project what consumers are buying online and what stores they're shopping in. Um, but the, the focus of my presentation is, is kind of to shine a flashlight on Wall Street's habits and some structural issues that really enable retail traders to compete on an even playing field. So I just want to show you briefly the type of complex data that's available out there today. And this is one of the things I'm excited about that we're working on. And when you have a cell phone or a smartphone, a lot of people like really cool free apps that come with it, um, Bitmoji, games. Whenever something's free, you should know it's not free. Um, your, your information is being shared, and in this particular case, your GPS location. And so this is real. This is essentially a view of a consumer actually walking around the mall and um, show you something else. OK, so we also have an email panel. If someone offers you free tools to clean up your inbox, uh, antivirus stuff, be very careful. The information is being shared. Um, and this is an anonymized Amazon email confirmation. Uh, one of the things we do is we have a couple data scientists that aggregate the volume of, of those emails to try to make inferences, as you can see, um, about how much stuff people are buying on Amazon. So I hope kind of what you're thinking is, as, as retail traders, um, well, this is great, Greg, but isn't this stuff really expensive? And absolutely. Some of my competitors have stuff that actually counts how many credit card purchases you make. It even has the exact receipt. And this stuff is 20, 30, 40, 50 thousand dollars a month. Um, a lot of my clients get it. And so I think as a retail trader, I'd be wondering, well, if these guys are getting all this amazing data and they're getting calls from these top analysts at big famous firms where people have complex financial models, is how can I compete? And uh, what I want to show you today is, is how you can do that. Um, first, I want to tell you a little story here. This is some of the data we had about a quarter or two ago on Foot Locker. And what this is a picture of is the top 400 Foot Locker stores, in our view of, are less or more people going to those Foot Locker stores. Um, it's not too complex. Um, can anyone see a pattern up here? There, there's, there's a lot of red. And so we thought this was pretty interesting. And we have some other data, which, which we coupled with it. I'm not going to try this laser pointer here, but um, yeah. So the gray line there is traffic to Foot Locker this year. And the blue line is a year ago. And this area here is kind of back to school shopping season. And you can see typically back to school is, is a, a big period where you expect a lot of sales for shoes. And it doesn't take um, too much complex analysis to see that this year, back to school really didn't do as well. So we had this data. We thought it was pretty, pretty interesting um, to share with our, with our clients. And they were interested. But um, and here's something I would encourage all of you to do as retail traders is just, if you're trading consumer discretionary, sign up to get the coupons. Um, it's not too complicated. Again, you could see this is this year. Uh, we don't need really a calculator or a spreadsheet to figure out that this year, 25% off, 75 or more, is a lot more promotional than last year's 15% off, I don't know what does it say, 100, 125 bucks. So, Taking this kind of ensemble all together, uh, we were pretty concerned about Foot Locker. And so um, our partners in New York, uh, some of my sales guys said, hey, Greg, this is, this is something really interesting. I know a few of the big holders, guys who own millions of shares of stock, big institutions. Uh, I'm going to go out to dinner with a couple of these guys and, and share your story and kind of alert them to this potential, not just short-term problem, but clearly a bigger problem with people trafficking Foot Locker stores. Um, and you can see these guys have two, three, four million shares of stock. You know, I was kind of excited. You know, you'd think that if you own four million shares of stock, you'd be a little bit worried that people aren't attending, going into the stores. Um, so my top sales guy comes back to me the next day with this. Um, let's see. Beep. I'm just going to read you a few parts from this. So I took such and such out to dinner 
from big fun, big institution. I spent some time speaking with him about his thoughts. He said something interesting, perhaps worth taking into account. He said, data which supports good ideas is better received from his portfolio manager than cautionary information which goes against the long, okay? Uh, this is from a fund that owns millions of shares of stock. If they spend a lot of time and energy looking into the position and have enough confidence, then they think of someone's data, this is just wrong. On the other hand, if they're leaning towards a position, reinforcing information is seen as more valuable. And it's, it's just, you know, I thought this was really interesting to see this in writing because it really crystallizes uh, the biases people have. It's very difficult when you've, you've got four million shares of stock that you've put together, a whole bunch of people in a room, and you're making a lot of money to get up from your desk and say, ooh, we might have made a mistake, guys. Like, Foot Locker's in big trouble here. And, and so this is basically how the entire industry works. If you're, go back really quickly here, um, you're the, let's say you're a big analyst at Goldman Sachs, a big retail analyst at Morgan Stanley. Now, <clears throat> we know this is how it works. I'm not the only one with, with something showing Foot Locker's bad. It's in the news. It's, you don't have to have the complex information, right? And you may not even know you're right. But if you're a Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs, why are you going to call one of these funds up and warn them about the position when they're just going to, the reaction is going to be, hey, <laughs> you know, Greg just called me up and he told me, hey, I'm not very good looking. You know, these positions we put together, you know, Th this isn't looking so good. And so what happens? The analysts just don't make the call. You know, why would you call up a guy who's not going to like the call? Your firm isn't going to get paid. You're not going to get a lot of trading revenue. You're not going to book a lot of commissions. So this kind of self-driving culture of essentially what it is, is it's confirmation bias. And it really drives behavior in the entire industry and the dynamic between the sell side people creating the research, and big institutional investors. And we need to really look. So the good thing is, as a retail investor, right, you didn't have that data. You don't, you don't always need it. You, you just need to kind of have an awareness, and, and we could learn here a little bit from Warren Buffett. Warren Buffett said whenever he has a long position, he always invites two or three advocates of the opposite side, two or three contrarians in to present the bear case on his positions, just to combat this uh, uh, insidiousness, which he calls confirmation bias. And I think it's something we can apply as, as retail traders to our own process. And I think it's something really cool to, with trade ideas and you know, having a system to take the emotion out of trading. Um, let's just move on here. So um, the moral of the story here is, is this is this summer and, you know, these guys, here's the stock, bad back to, this is bad spring, and this is bad back to school season. A massive drop. And I kind of just put on the bottom there, um, you don't, I don't know, it's pretty small, but it's just a few of the upgrades that occurred um, prior to this happening. So I want to move on to, this clicker's a little, ooh. All right, so this is another kind of, case study again about, about how you can avoid these biases and um, similar kind of dynamic with the department stores. And uh, this is JCPenney's. Everyone knows the department stores are in trouble. And we were kind of fortunate. We have something that basically aggregates all the email volumes that they send you. And again, all you got to do is sign up to receive their emails. It's not overly complex. Um, but our data scientists aggregate this information and we're basically tracking how many promotional emails you're getting from JCPenney's. And we code it based on how steep the discounts are. And it doesn't, again, it's not super complicated to see that in order to generate the sales, they're, they're, they're really having to push out massive 50, 75% off liquidation style discounts to their customers. Um, here's the coupons. You just sign up, you get them. 50% um, off, 80% off final markdowns. And now, oh, and one, let me go back one. And one of the things that um, we see for pennies JT, is I don't know they have a lot of catalysts for the holidays. That up. I just want to play you um, something from a top analyst here. 
No, start it right there. Whether it's the initiatives they have with Sephora, whether it's their speed initiatives, with what they've gotten a lot of their core apparel product out for this upcoming back-to-school season, we think certainly they've revamped their private label brand, City Streets, which now is more fa fashion-focused. Their back-to-school promotions just began, and certainly what we've been seeing from our Feet on the Street checks been encouraging. So the stock's been down, and I have catalysts ahead. And I think a lot of the department stores, we've seen pressure on them, whether it's Macy's, obviously Nordstrom has the go private um, it, it, catalyst that's going on. But I certainly have a stock that's come down in JCPenney that's improving apparel and optimizing their store base. Jim Labenthal, the floor is yours. All right. Well, Dana, thank you for this. But, <laughs> but um, look, on a serious note, you do your channel checks. I right do there? my channel checks. I mean, it may sound a little silly, but I love exactly. doing that, okay? I was in a JCPenney store you. this past weekend in Michigan. And I got to say, I was really pleasantly surprised at the amount of traffic. But one area in particular, which has been ground zero for the Amazon effect, ha has shown signs of coming back, at least in what I'm seeing. And that's women's apparel and handbags of all things. I mean, look, I'm just, I'm just observing. There were a lot of people in that area. I'm curious, number one, if you're seeing that, and number two, if you think that's real or maybe just an aberration. Well, let's just take it out of that space because you can even be broader than just department stores. When you're talking about handbags, take a look at what Coach has been doing lately. The innovation that we've seen in Coach is impressive. They've been also able to add to their portfolio with Kate Spade and obviously Stuart Weitzman. But I don't think it's all handbag companies because obviously we've all been seeing the troubles of cores. So, yes, I do think that there's uh, some JT, improvement there. JT, can you there. skip ahead? When you talk about... I just want, this is about a four minute segment, so we're just going to skip ahead here to the end. Garbage from Marv Ellison on several calls, you know, uh, investor conferences since the earnings call is a lot more positive than this. If you get a positive same store sales this year and the street's calling for down 2.8%, this thing is going to spring back like you're not going to believe. I don't know if you're shorted or you just want to make fun of me, but I, this is not the place to be short the stock. Sure. Okay, thanks, JT. So um, let, let's 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 kind of review here. JC Penney's is our top pick, and now again, it's interesting that this is a really good analyst. So how could I mean people are wrong all the time, but the interesting thing here is is JC Penney is our top pick among department stores. So it's a bad sector, and we're trying to pick out one particular stock in a bad sector. Um, so I want to show you on this chart, just since this is kind of relevant to today, okay? So you can just guess what these are. We don't, we don't need to see the press releases, right? Bad quarter, mm -hmm. bad quarter, bad quarter. Um, we did that in, within 10 seconds. Um, so now here, this is, this, is, this is around four and change. Let's just call it four and a quarter. But what, does anyone have any ideas what, what's causing what do you think the culprit in this uptrend is right here? Buying back short? The, 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 I think that's probably part of it, um, people covering. But I think another part is the person we just saw speaking is calling up her best clients, the big institutional customers with this sort of, I mean, I guess you call it research. And they're getting in, <laughs> right? They're getting in ahead of you. And now they're going on TV. And so they're driving the price, right? They're bidding up shares. They're buying a little, right? They're bidding up shares. It's still so, you know, not too far off the 52 weeks. They're bidding up shares. And now we're here, right? And now she's sharing the information with pumping it on CNBC, pushing it out to retail. You don't need to participate in this. Just ignore this information. Just do your own work, have your own systems, ignore this analysis, because you're not going to get the call here. And it might not even be right anyways. So I just, I also want to review kind of some of the verbiage because it's, this one I thought was particularly interesting. And I, you don't hear this when you're walking around as a consumer. Um, I mean, in terms of fashion, I think would be the word when you think of coach. And, and the quote is, take a look at what coach has been doing lately. The innovation has been impressive. And this is just language you don't hear people shopping when they're looking for handbags at a mall. You could, I don't know where they were in Michigan. Um, I went to Michigan, but I hope when they're looking at the bags, the people buying them aren't saying, 
look at this innovation in this handbag here. Um, I don't think they are. Um, and so let's take a look, though. Let's, let's play it out, and we'll do a little quiz here. Um, we could really see this. If we spread it over a long time period, we should see this amazing innovation that Coach has been doing, as she's describing, because she's very excited about the stock. So we're just going to play a little game. We've got a bunch of years there, uh, multiple choice, um, 2010, 15, 17, and 13. Okay, I see. This is one year. Uh, another year. Another year. And another year. Um, are there any guesses? What about this last one? The most recent. Okay, Brad nailed it. He asked, he said, this one's the most recent. The stitching's, <laughs> stitching's really innovative. Um, but anyhow, we don't need to go back and review those, but this ability to monogram bags is the amazing innovation that is just now being talked about. I didn't know that was something new. Um, I didn't even notice that until Yeah, well, Brad, Brad figured it out. So, yeah. He's smarter. He's a detailed one. Detailed. So anyways, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to show you some other innovation as, as a compare and contrast. And, and this isn't broken. This is what the product looked like in 2010, okay, just six, seven years ago. All right. And here's what it looks like now. OK? So everyone know what that is? Yeah. yeah. OK. This is something you can order a pizza on, play whatever music you want to hear. Um, pretty much find out anything you want to know without using your fingers or touching anything. So, but how could someone this smart and well-educated in Wall Street frame it in that way to us? I mean, the, 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 it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, oh, so here's what happened with the innovation at Coach, okay? Again, you are here and driving the prices up. Now we're on TV talking about it because we've, we've gotten our institutions to buy a little, okay? And now there's the quarter, which, you know, didn't have much innovation. And, and, and the, the chart guys here would know a lot more about me. But if you look at it, if you take away this, you know, you do have a nice pattern here, just nothing. There's no crazy innovation. Um, and, and I don't know if you heard that the troubles at Michael Coors, again, in fashion, I mean, at least you need to understand that it's in fashion and trends can change very quickly. So this is the trouble that Coors was having. Really, what they're saying is it's already in the price chart. And again, that's where I think um, the systems approach is almost better because we already know Coors is having problems. We don't need someone on TV to tell us, and we really shouldn't be listening to them. I mean, this chart tells us, obviously, Coors has had some problems. I mean, look at the chart. And, but you're telling us about the problems here. <clears throat> I, I cut out that part, but there's a part in the interview where uh, the CNBC host says, what do you think of the new CFO? And the respondent from the analyst, I know him. We've spent time together in the past, extremely capable. And again, this is where the retail trader really benefits. You know, you don't have to get persuaded by an insider or management whose whole job is to sell a narrative to you. You can just remain objective. You won't always be right, but at least you have a process. Um, if you're around someone all the time, you're most likely going to be persuaded by them. So the, the, the retail, the, the, the top analysts on Wall Street, their job is to go have dinners with management teams. It's impossible to remain unbiased. And that's what happened. OK, so here it's getting pushed higher, all right? And then there's another bad quarter. And I'm not saying that we're going to all get it right, because I'm wrong a lot, and sure, I cherry pick these. but. You're OK if you, if you bought the stock in here and were wrong. You're not paying nearly the same penalty as if, OK, you got distracted and bought this here. And so it's not that you're always going to be right, but just turn down the noise. Um, because these insiders, they, it, it's too biased of a process. Um, Again, let's just circle back to this, this framing it as, as innovation and understand really what's going on here. How those terms could possibly be used in something that um, anyone knows is fashion. And fashion can change very quickly. Uh, I've heard so, particularly for ladies. Um, so the reason why this, this word is used is because the, the analysts on Wall Street operate in silos, OK? So this particular analyst is soft lines or handbags. 
But there's all kinds of sectors, apparel, hardline, soft lines, industrial, software, hardware, internet, restaurants, healthcare, and mining. Um, it, 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 so they almost don't have a choice. It's not that they're not highly capable. It's that analyst, from a professional standpoint, isn't paying attention to Amazon. I mean, the fact that she goes on TV and fails to mention the biggest disruptor in retail history is it, kind of weird, you know, particularly with a stock like any, any person should be able to figure out that that's what's going on. And so lack of mentioning it really is just the result of this bias because the structure of Wall Street forces her to work in this, in this silo. Um, so so when, if you do listen, be very careful to listen what companies aren't, aren't mentioned. Okay, this is meant to be in here. Um, and it's on to, to, to another, I think, interesting area I, I want to warn you guys about and basically tell you you don't need to pay attention to. And, and that's these carefully crafted press releases where teams of expensive overpaid consultants are hired to craft earnings releases and manage the earnings calls. And so I'm going to try to read some of this. It's hard to read. It says, this is L Brands owns Victoria's Secret. Um, and it says, for the four weeks ending April 30th, comparable sales were down 5%. They were positively impacted by the Easter holiday by 3%. But for April, the exit of swim and apparel had a negative impact of 6 percentage points um, on overall sales and 10 percentage points on Victoria's Secret. So <clears throat> what they're really trying to do with this carefully constructed release is compartmentalize the problems the business is having instead of letting you see it kind of holistically, they're trying to exclude areas in which they're, they're having trouble with, right? And so, interestingly enough, oh, I'm gonna back up one. This approach is really effective with analysts because of the training and the desire to have everything modeled out in, in a sophisticated Excel model, all parts of the business. Wall Street loves this. And so, this was the response after that quarter in which sales were down, from Wall Street, a series of upgrades. It's, it's surprising, sales were down. Just leave it at that, you know, and, and it pushes the stock higher. And so I just wanna translate that press release for you. It says if we don't, it didn't include the products that didn't sell because consumers didn't like them, sales would have been better. <laughs> so is that something you wanna buy or sell, you know, on, on that press release? And again, it's the idea of Wall Street wants to model everything out, you know, and if we just didn't count this or didn't count that, and, and people who have extensive accounting training and are trained to listen to these have no choice because they have to model it out, otherwise their boss will come to them and say, hey, how come you didn't model it out? They said, you know, the, the, the swim was six percentage points. As, again, as a retail, a retail investor, you don't need to worry about this. Just ignore it. Um, and so, again, I'm just going, I just want to remind you that management commentary is designed pretty much for one reason. It's to drive analyst buy ratings. It's not an educational thing where if you miss it, you're not informed. It's not designed to share the truth, okay? These press releases are designed to persuade, not educate. And um, this was one of the ones we've seen uh, kind of in the retail universe where people really just aren't going around to the stores as much. They may be ordering... Um, other things online, perhaps. Um, so here's what happened. You know, and again, these things usually give you warning. I mean, so this isn't out of nowhere. It's one bad quarter, two bad quarters. And again, here's the excitement. Buying this compartmental, if we just didn't count swimwear when people are buying swimsuits in the late spring, then we'd be okay. And soon after, it's another bad quarter when that excuse fades. So, so another category I, I think that really needs to be addressed is, because it's very tempting, the allure of like the big kill, you know, but predicting a buyout or a takeover is like winning the lottery. It's going to happen, it's just not gonna happen to you, okay? <laughs> and so uh, I wanna share an example of a uh, business that's really struggling and, uh, let's see, J let's see, JT can clue that up. Let's get a little video here. Booyah. Oh, ever since I came out here last month and told you that GNC, the number one retailer of vitamins, 
and nutritional supplements in the country should acquire its top rival, Vitamin Shop? Rumors have been rife that GNC itself is the target of intense interest from the private equity space. In short, private equity players have reportedly been sniffing around, swirling, pondering the idea of taking the company private and then unlocking the tremendous value that's buried underneath. Now, here on Mad Money, we like to wear a lot of hats. And tonight, I think it's time to put on you my skip ahead, JT. banking cap. And we'll the six been long segments. So such a massive buyback, get this, I calculate $8 per share. Trades right now, 11.8 times next year's earnings. So if they can earn 8 bucks per share next year, thanks to the aggressive refranchising plan I'm offering, and an even more aggressive buyback that I'm insisting on, $94 stock, 143% higher than where it is currently trading. Pie in the sky? Companies that refranchise all their stores do tend to get rewarded with much higher valuations. Uh, okay, we talked all that's of enough um, of him. So... Uh, one thing, again, you're not always, we're not, it's not about uh, being correct all the time. It's, it's, it's don't buy bad businesses because someone gets on TV with a microphone and the products in front of them and does kind of this voodoo dance and talks about really complex financial engineering. We're going to raise $2 billion in capital. We're going to buy back stock. We're going to earn 8 bucks a share. Um, so, so just a, a history. This is Jim Cramer talking about it going to, I, my chart doesn't go up that high, it'd be up here, maybe up there in the ceiling. Um, that's 96 up in here. Um, and so, you know, just, just do your own, have your own analysis and just exclude this. You won't always be right, but you'll avoid a lot of losers. The stores in 2017 aren't really needed to sell commodities, and there's Vitamin Shop as well. Um, The last category, a uh, very important one really, is, is, is IPOs. Um, because of the marketing and the financial news that these things get, it's really alluring to try to get involved in something new that's not yet out there. Um, and again, just take the companies that come out there, you won't always be right, but take the companies at face value and really try to avoid hot tech IPOs where there's no tech involved whatsoever. Okay, so this is actually interestingly considered an internet company. And, but when we go, this, I took this right off Blue Apron's website. It's really, they take food and put it in a box, and then you get the food. So to me, it just doesn't pass the smell test of, of being high technology companies that we think about. Um, and I've got a little clip. This is interestingly from, from, uh, from Fortune. So we're here with Matt Wadiak, who's the co-founder of it up a Blue Apron. It's a hot startup, it's a meal kit delivery service. It's been around for almost four years now. So I thought we could use one of our amazing green rated fish from Monterey Bay Aquarium today, Veramundi, and do a little uh, potato, cucumber, and heirloom tomato salad. This is like really typical of what a Blue Apron meal might be. And then I thought we could do a little pole bean salad on the side, which will be delicious accoutrement for the fish. We'll make a little tri-colored bean salad. You don't have to be like super fancy with your cuts. That's a lot of our cutting done right there. I'm gonna take a shallot. We'll just do a rough cut on the shallot. He's cut beans. So we've peeled a little garlic. We'll run a knife through it. If you take it down to a paste, it blends in really nicely. Can you toss these in the pot of boiling Does water? Does anyone know what, what channel this probably should be on instead of fortune? Cooking and food. Cooking isn't food just network. about being in the kitchen and the activity of cooking. Cooking is about supporting more broadly an agricultural system that makes sense. My focus was really bringing that kind of food to folks in New York and eventually that culminated into starting Blue Apron a few years ago with my co-founders. And it was always at our heart when we started the company to really work with great foods and great ingredients. When we started serving millions of meals, so the scalability of our food system just isn't there to provide- Okay, let's access. just stop right there. Um, so the scalability of the food system just isn't there to bring you food. So these, these little things that people say should have you just doing your own work, um, very complicated tool you can use called Google to see potential competitors out there. Uh -huh. And it doesn't seem too challenging to get food um, these days. And there's also another, again, company not mentioned, we need to be aware of right there that seems to do a pretty good job of delivering it. Um, and so, again, it's the system is designed to provide you misleading information 
to enable people that have been compensated by bankers, uh, like the nice gentleman pictured, to cash out. You don't need to participate. Don't participate. And interestingly, of course, Blue Apron surges 9% as, surprise, surprise, the underwriters started at us by. The people compensated a commission by the company to be taken public want now you to buy this stock. Goldman, they love it. Blue Apron rockets higher. Goldman, other analysts say buy. And again, I, I skipped the part, but again, the message of these companies, you have to be very careful. He, he speaks about, oh, we're spreading Blue Apron through word of mouth. And it's, the companies want to give you the, the, the idea that there's this organic, ground up interest in these products and services. Again, just subscribe to see the coupons. And what I'm showing you here basically is all the coupons aggregated. And this is before they went public. Companies ho humming along, they don't need to send a lot of promotion. They go public, um, all of a sudden they are absolutely desperate, sending massive coupons, essentially giving away free food. So you can sign up for these coupons yourself and you'll, you'll avoid getting involved in this. Um, and again, let's just bring it all back to what really matters for us, which is not how to cook a meal, but how to make money in the market. And you could really see the, these, these usually end the same way, right? Uh, the underwriters, okay, the stocks, investors are smart. The public quickly figures out, well, there's really not much to this Blue Apron as a business. Um, and so investors are figuring it out after they go public, and they need the underwriters now to come in in their independent research departments. And here's, here's them fooling some people. They're getting the message out on CNBC and on TV, and I will use the word fooling, you know, tricking people into buying the stock, and you know, here's the earnings, they're terrible soon after it collapses. And again, so just be very, use common sense when you hear internet IPOs is to see if there's actual innovation there. Um, let's see if this thing, whoop. Whoop. So this is, let's back up. One area though that I think people can have success in is very powerful brands. Um, this is McDonald's, and does anyone see a, a potential problem in this picture? The problem is, not, yeah, not, there's a long line, that's right. So it's not lack of demand. There's demand, but there's a long line, okay? So, so you've got a very powerful brand with, with a problem. Um, let's see if this will click through. Okay, so here's now 2017. That's 2010 to 2017. This is innovation. This is a big change that's gonna impact their business. And um, I just, of course, had to uh, play this video. Okay, my turn. Add to order. Yep. And That's how it works Jack now. Turn. Happy Meal. Happy Meal. Happy Meal. Happy Meal. You have to press Happy Meal. Let him do it. Um, hamburger, or cheeseburger, um, chicken nuggets. There. Um, sauce. what sauce? Barbecue? Ketchup. Barbecue. Ketchup. Is it? That. Okay. Okay, that's it. So, uh, let's see. Faster too, right? Oop. So, oh, there we go. So, um, I put my kids in the video, um, but that's the whole point. Is is that's innovation? That's something you should be interested in buying. Is it has to be very simple, and it has to make something you do in your daily life easier. And I hadn't been to a McDonald's in a long time, and I'm disappointed. Um, where's this stock chart? And this is what McDonald's chart looks like, okay? So that's an old brand, but that's real innovation. And again, some of the Wall Street guys, because of the nature of their business, are stuck. If you're the internet analyst, you can't go and make bullish commentary on McDonald's, right? And then conversely, they do have restaurant analysts, but they're not really focused on technology. And so you guys, and what we can do is just consumers with a brain, is when we're walking around the world, evaluate, does this, does this improve something? And really, if an eight-year-old can figure it out and they think it's a positive thing, it's probably a pretty good thing. And you could go read a lot of complicated research right now, or you could just, again, I think the price action is very revealing, and it'll just tell you that this has really eliminated a lot of bottlenecks. The stock's up 50% in less than a year, and, and it's not a hot tech IPO. So this is one type of food, and Blue Apron is the other type of food. Um, and just to kind of wrap things up here, um, I'm probably over time, let's see. Never. Never, okay, good.
So again, a little bit of trivia. Um, does anyone know what these stocks have in common? I'm going to say the names. In the names, pay less shoe source. Yes? Let's keep going. Yeah. Dick's Sporting Goods. Dick's is still alive, barely. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond. Yes, but still more. Vitamin Shop. Toys R Us. Okay. Brick yeah, brick and mortar. Okay, we're we're really close now. Um, but but Lululemon's a brick and mortar. It wasn't up there. So these are the returns. Uh, this this uh, the gentleman nailed this with pay less shoe source. Gonzo. And these are the returns of these. Been down 50% in a year. Down 80% in a year. Unbelievable numbers. And what they are, are they it, that's right, okay. Uh, Sherry asks, are they at the top of their categories? That's right. So Lululemon's doing well, but they have stores. But these are product categories that you can just go to Amazon, literally the exact word that is in their business, Dick's Sporting Goods. And we don't need to go to Dick's, we can go to Amazon Sporting Goods right here, right? <laughs> And so Bed Bath and Beyond, pay less shoe stores. Really avoid businesses where in, no matter what you hear from the street, where the exact product category is a category on Amazon. And that's just, I think, a good guideline for 2017 and beyond. Um, and I just want to show you one last kind of tool as retail investors, if you're involved in the consumer space. It's very cheap, it's free, it's Google Trends. Um, you could figure it out, and I just showed an interesting, you know, this is just Clinton and Trump, the interest online, because Google's basically got all the information. Just go to them, and they'll tell you how popular um, certain products and brands are. Um, let's just wrap it up. You can't afford big data. Don't worry about it. The sell side industry, sorry, you can't afford big, big, um, big data like the institutions have. Um, but sell side research is really designed to sell and persuade. These big shareholders can't move quickly. As a retail investor, you can change your mind. Um, you don't have a boss in your room that's going to ask you and make you produce a new financial model. You can be nimble and small. So in Wall Street, changing your mind is considered a weakness. Takeovers are lottery tickets. Avoid them. IPOs are exit opportunities for insiders. Um, avoid recommendations from firms that are getting paid. And uh, lastly, in retail, Amazon. Um, that's it. Thank you very much. Do we have time for any questions? Anyone have any questions? Or anyone have any questions? I have a question. Yes. Uh, do you mind sharing a couple of exact examples where you use your data in your work currently that proven to be positive and impacted? The yeah, I, th I think one of the interesting areas is in, in uh, so he asked the question, are there some other examples where I showed a lot of negative, <laughs> where, where where, um, where, where there's positive things going on. But you use your data. Yes, absolutely. Slide, so give us something interesting like yes. uh, G GPS usage or something that you can share. Yeah, so um, one of the areas where, where, where we found um, that is a little different, a lot of businesses on Wall Street really try to model exact revenues that quarter, very coincident type indicators. But like with our email panel, one of the interesting things we look at is new customers that might not be buying yet, but are signing up for a particular service. And just tying it back to tech, so businesses like Shopify and Wix, again, um, the data showed a lot of new customers signing up, right? They haven't yet paid. It's not a recurring revenue stream, but you're building a website. Once you build a website, whether it's on GoDaddy or Wix, um, then you're sort of committed to that business. And um, I think that's an area we'll be doing more work on where we have. So um, those businesses, uh, people are signing up. And, and I'm looking for more businesses like that in my research that help little guys, small businesses, connect to the Amazons of the world to sell their products. Dan? So the confirmation bias of the sell side analysts, is there any way that that can be combated, not by a retail investor, but I'm just saying in the climate, do you ever see that really changing in any way 
or is it always going to stay the same like this? Because if it does, then it really doesn't benefit the people. You know, it's like really. There, I think uh, Dan asked, is this ever going to change in terms of big institutions and, and confirmation bias? I don't think so because the individuals are really well compensated. So ultimately their interest is protecting a very high paying job, um, potentially seven figure jobs. And so it's gonna be very, very difficult um, in that environment to say, oh, I'm changing my mind, because you could be wrong. And so again, I think that's the advantage the little guy has is you, you don't have to have that challenge. So um, you, you've mentioned a number of ideas uh, how us little retail traders can kind of keep an eye on things, like signing up for coupon, and, and then a lot of ideas about what to ignore. Just ignore all the verbiage and the noise coming out of Wall Street. What, what are some of the other, you know, are there other things that we can do that will help us, like, you know, in addition to signing up for coupons? Any other kind of, are, are there other data sources other than Google Trends, you know, stuff like that? I think Google Trends is a phenomenal yeah. source. Yeah, and, and the coupons. Um, Oh, so, so he asked, are there other data sources as a retail um, trader you can use? And, um, you know, there, there's some cheap tools, very cheap tools. I'm not going to say the specific ones, but if you research on web traffic, very, very, there's, there's several very cheap tools I would, I would recommend you look at that if you're involved in trading consumer stocks in 2017, you should have at least a basic understanding of um, web traffic since that's where people browse for items. And there's some, if you just look, there's some pretty cheap stuff out there for that. Yeah. Brad. So I, lo I love what you do, Greg. The, the information is really interesting, but specific to something like a foot locker where you're analyzing the foot traffic of people walking into a brick and mortar. Is that something that you would do in conjunction with analyzing their, their web traffic and their online sales? Because wouldn't that be just as much of a component of the revenue, even though obviously you're right. And down so Brad asked in terms of the foot traffic and just I think I think what he's inferring is that's not enough in 2017 with just you know they they're used this buzzword omni-channel you could be browsing and buying online absolutely I mean we we, we have we look at we look at web traffic very closely yeah as, as one of um, you know one one trend we found though that's kind of interesting um, with web traffic you know, that the retailers have been getting is when they have too much inventory or product now, they send out a coupon online only, and that's a quick way of dumping stuff very cheap. Um, so, you know, that's been a little, a little more of a gotcha, whereas in prior years, what, what we really want to count is, ooh, you're looking for some shoes, you end up at footlocker.com and buy them, not, uh, you're on their list because you bought shoes from them three years ago, now they send you a thing for 50% off all Nikes. I mean, that's not a real quality sale. What about price point comparisons, too, between Amazon, what they offer, which is usually a couple bucks cheaper than do I take that into, sorry, Brad asked if I take into account price differences between Amazon and, uh, and, and Foot Locker. I mean, I think we look at the, the prices of the coupons, yeah. Um, but I mean, I think you bring up a great point and that's if, if these types of questions you have about the business, you know, that it's so easy to do, like to your point, um, that could be sold cheaper on Amazon, it's probably a good business to avoid. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. Thank you.